Welcome everybody to this afternoon's uh, Antimicrobial Awareness Week workshop uh, 2022. It's a pleasure to put this on uh, on behalf of NCAS and our center here also for the Center of Antibiotic Allergy Research in Melbourne. We have got really three fantastic talks for you today, really centered around a learning health system and the way antibiotic allergy fits into that, what we think quite nicely. And then a panel discussion, including those speakers and also our project manager for the National Antibiotic Allergy Network, Elise Mitri, who I'll introduce at the end. But um, we might get started with the first speaker today. And the first speaker is going to be Dr. Morgan Rose. Uh, Morgan is a PhD candidate with the National Center for Infections in Cancer. He's an ID physician um, at Peter Mac and Austin. He's also an ID physician trying to become an allergist, um, which uh, we're trying to convert a lot of people to do. Uh, his PhD really is trying to target one of those really impacted groups, which is critical care and immunocompromised with allergy. And his first talk is going to be about data to knowledge, clinical gaps in existing evidence. So welcome, Morgan, and take it away. Thanks very much, Jason. I'll just share screen. So if you can just let me know once that's up and clear. Yes. Yep. Very good. Um, so yes, good afternoon, everybody. As Jason said, I'm doing my PhD principally looking at um, at um, relatively underserviced populations and vulnerable populations, and in particular, um, for the purpose of this talk, critical illness. Um, so exactly as Jason said, um, really the the key um, key to these talks is how a learning health systems approach fits within the work that we're doing around antibiotic allergy, um, and my presentation. Sorry, I'll just have to move through a few of these and you can see um, it really is really is integral to everything that we're doing in antibiotic allergy broadly as, um, as a collection of, uh, of researchers um, with the data that we're deriving from our, um, from, our, um, from our clinical work and from our research work, then uh, feeding into new potential diagnostics, new potential health, service, um, health services and health service programs, and then in turn generating more data, more ideas that we can work towards um, improving our services and improving um, and developing new practices from there on. The purpose of, uh, of my discussion and really the body of, uh, of my work at the moment, um, it really is focused on this area of, um, of identifying data that's already existing, analysing that data, identifying gaps in the data that we can potentially fill as we build towards a, uh, a novel uh, health program. And really, as Jason mentioned, that really is in the space of critical illness and looking at antibiotic allergy assessment within critical illness. And as with many of our uh, of our new health program developments, this really came about through um, through clinical cases that we were identifying, and and this case is just a, a really nice, clean example of that, and uh, and represents many of the patients that we've seen in the past. So, Mr. C, a 57 year old with, um, who was admitted to the intensive care unit um, in the setting of septic shock, and found to have uh, Streptococcus pyogenes in blood cultures. Um, sadly, though, for Mr. C, he had an allergy label with an allergy reported to penicillins, which uh, which for all of the ID docs and, um, and AMS teams in the room, you can see it would be absolutely ideal to give this man for treating his infection. So really the, the clinical question that arose was, can we undertake penicillin allergy assessment in ICU? Um, but that was then swiftly followed up by the further questions of, well, what, what data do we actually need to answer this question? And what data already exists that could help us in answering that? <clears throat> And that can be broken down into, into really three categories. So what is the relevance of antibiotic allergy labels um, and trying to address them within the ICU setting? Um, so what is the burden of allergy labels in ICU and, and what's the impact of those labels in the ICU? Um, how feasible is it to even consider antibiotic allergy assessment within ICU? Um, particularly then what are the enablers of that as a, um, as a space for doing assessment and challenges um, versus what are the actual intrinsic challenges of, uh, of critical illness and the critical illness setting um, before we look at imp uh, implementing any uh, assessment programs? And then finally, is there, is there any early evidence around safety and efficacy of allergy assessment in that setting? So I'm just going to work through these in detail as we work through what, what data exists, what extra data do we need to be able to try and answer that question, what are we doing to push towards developing a program. So looking at the burden of allergy labels within ICU, so particularly a very local example um, 
that um, that was run through the Austin Hospital. Um, so Moran uh, published in uh, in 2019, a prospective single centre case control study over a three month period in a, in a mixed cohort of surgical and medical ICU patients, identifying 309 um, adult patients in ICU over that time with, uh, with almost 17% of those with an antibiotic allergy label. And as is consistent um, across community and inpatients and particularly uh, inpatients in ICU, penicillin was, uh, was the most common drug uh, reported as the, um, as the reason for their allergy. And so we can see that uh, that allergy labels are very common in the ICU setting, at least you know, even more common than uh, than community or other inpatients. But what really is the impact of those uh, of those labels in terms of their care? And so similarly, in the same study, um, um, Moran described um, that 80% of patients in the ICU over that period were receiving antibiotics. So anybody that had an antibiotic allergy label at that time was potentially at risk of, of coming up against uh, an adverse event because of needing antibiotic therapy. And so whether that was um, whether that was delays in care, whether that was um, having, having a broader spectrum antimicrobial that may not be quite so well tolerated or maybe less effective against the infection itself. That's a large, uh, large burden of exposure to antibiotics, um, and we can see there that that and even even within the group of people who were requiring antibiotics, that proportion who had an antibiotic allergy label was even slightly higher. Um, and particularly in this study, we could see that all comers, irrespective of what the allergy label was, uh, there was a significantly decreased um, likelihood of receiving beta-lactam antimicrobials and a, um, and a significantly increased likelihood of uh, receiving vancomycin as a, uh, as a marker of uh, alternative, alternative antibiotics. And importantly, I should say here that there was no difference in terms of the, uh, in terms of um, the resistance patterns of the uh, of the infections that the patients had. Um, then looking at um, at other potential complications of antibiotic allergy labels in ICU. So then. Uh, in a study from the US, um, looking at a single centre over a 20 week period, they identified 40 adults with sepsis, 52% um, of whom had a penicillin antibiotic allergy label. Um, and we could see that in those individuals, there was um, a significantly increased rates of infection recurrence, 30 day readmission to ICU um, and medical ICU length of stay. So we can clearly see that yes, the burden of antibiotic allergy exists within ICU, there is a substantial impact, um, particularly on the care that's actually occurring within the, uh, the ICU space. Um, and by extension, then there is potential benefit from being able to remove these allergy labels in, uh, in the ICU. But really, how feasible is it to think about a, um, an assessment and delabeling program within ICU? Um, in terms of the enablers, there's certainly been a growing interest in, um, in um, intensive care antimicrobial stewardship over uh, over the uh, recent years, but also particularly there's there's certainly motivation to optimise the prescribing in real time. So in that ICU setting, so patients like Mr C who had a, a clearly penicillin susceptible infection that would absolutely benefit from penicillins if we could assess that and uh, and identify if that was uh, no longer present, that having access to penicillins would be excellent for him. And in addition to that, it's obviously a very closely monitored environment. And so the ability to quickly identify any potential adverse events from uh, allergy assessment and testing and also intervene to, um, to, uh, to stop those immediately. However, the ICU setting does come with a number of challenges. <clears throat> and really, um, the three key ones here are the uh, characteristics of traditional skin testing, uh, the effects of critical illness itself, um, and then also the effects of critical care therapies. In terms of skin testing, which is, has traditionally been um, the initial port of call for antibiotic allergy assessment um, beyond, uh, beyond history taking, um, it's obviously time intensive, particularly in preparing the, uh, preparing the reagents themselves. It's labor intensive in terms of having, having someone that's in a position to be able to undertake the, uh, the skin testing. But also probably most importantly is that there's specialist training required to be able to perform and then interpret those, uh, those skin tests. And so there's really quite limited access um, across health services. Now, there's an additional challenge though within the ICU space beyond those, um, those routine concerns. And that's really that there's been a, a number of concerns raised around the reliability of skin testing within uh, critical illness and the ICU setting. 
um, both with, with higher rates than seen in the community or any other inpatients of negative skin tests in ICU, um, but then also um, even more challenging, um, the, the association of, uh, of testing being done in ICU with a negative histamine control, and so therefore not really being able to, uh, to reliably interpret any further results uh, from those tests at the time. In addition to the challenges around skin testing, um, the effect of critical illness itself um, does, does uh, impose some limitations on, uh, on what we can do. So um, the high number of patients who may be delirious, uh, who may still be, uh, who may be, um, who may have uh, ventilatory supports or invasive ventilatory supports, intubation, um, that really limits our capacity to take a thorough um, a thorough allergy history, um, but then also the, the hemodynamic instability of individuals in ICU can make it potentially challenging then to identify whether a patient's actually having, a, um, having an adverse event following their testing. So if, uh, if there's um, labile blood pressures at the time of our testing, it's very difficult then to interpret, um, could that potentially have been secondary to, uh, to the challenge or is this part of their critical illness? And then finally, actually critical care therapies themselves can, uh, can further challenge our ability to, uh, to assess antibiotic allergies. So um, administration of adrenaline obviously can mask uh, immediate reactions, uh, but then also high dose steroids uh, in the setting of uh, stress dose steroids um, could have a dose dependent masking effect on delayed reactions as well. So again, depending on the, uh, on the nature of that, uh, of that original, um, original allergy reported. So, We've looked at the relevance of, um, of even asking this question within ICU. We've looked at, um, at some of the challenges and some of the benefits of potentially uh, employing a, a program in the ICU space. So really what data do we have around the potential safety and efficacy of, uh, of doing this testing in ICU? And so <clears throat> this is the point where we, where we almost have the, the least data, uh, which is not necessarily surprising because it's becoming more and more specialised as we move towards a, uh, an allergy assessment and, uh, and delabeling program. Um, but where do we start if we want to look at this? And so really the, uh, the most logical point to start at, given the challenges that I just outlined, are really looking at intensive care patients who are clinically stable, so are not receiving inotropes, don't have any ventilatory support requirements and are not on high dose steroids. Um, and then also by extension, they would tend to be um, alert and oriented and able to provide a more thorough, uh, a th more thorough history. And so we can be more reliable in terms, of, in terms of the potential safety of our testing. But also then having a focus on low risk allergy, and really this does two things. One, um, with a with low risk phenotypes, there's minimal risk from positive tests. So um, in the event of a mild rash, we can obviously look at treating that, but um, but that's less concerning than uh, than some more uh, severe conditions. Um, but also being able to be more confident in not requiring any skin testing up front, and we can then avoid some of those challenges and complications that have come from, from questions of the validity of skin testing in the ICU setting. And so how do we look to, uh, to identify patients with a low risk allergy? And this is really where, uh, where previous work in other inpatients and in, uh, and in community uh, testing comes to the fore. Um, and so um, particularly validated, um, validated phenotyping tools such as this is the, um, the Centre for Antibiotic Allergy Research um, Antibiotic Allergy Assessment Tool. And you can see that, that it's, um, this has been designed for both um, allergy teams but also non-allergists to be able to um, clearly define the, uh, how an individual allergy presented um, and then also colour coding that by severity and so, uh, so the, the highest severity um, the highest severity symptom that the patient is describing then drives further um, further advice around um, around testing and interventions. So this was um, this the validation of this tool was published by Devchant in uh, in 2019, um, and really it just provides a consistent phenotyping vocabulary, um, and is designed for application by non-allergists. And you can see there the validation of this tool in non-allergists uh, was very effective in being able to identify um, the uh, the correct severity of phenotype and therefore being able to identify low risk patients, for example, and, uh, and have them proceed to oral challenge. 
and then looking at how this tool has actually been used in in precisely this question. So uh, using this, applying this tool to identify low risk patients that are then um, that are then um, in a in a position to have direct oral challenge rather than having any skin testing first. Um, so Chua um, Chua in um, just last year. Um, published a study looking at seven months over 2019, identifying almost um, 1,800 patients um, in an inpatient setting um, with 68% um, with of them um, uh, having a penicillin allergy and 45% of those penicillin allergies being identified as low risk on the allergy assessment tool. Now, 200 of those patients proceeded to oral challenge um, with then only six having a positive result. So, uh, so that was a retention of their allergy label after that testing. And it's worth noting that within those six, none of them had a severe, um, had a severe reaction. Um, and, and I believe only two required um, any intervention at all, um, which, was, um, which was typically uh, simple oral antihistamines. And then really the probably the most important data uh, that we've been able to um, to access in informing our process towards a, um, a health services program um, is the safety data that already exists, albeit in a small fashion within the intensive care unit space. And so this is a study from Vanderbilt that was just published this year, a retrospective single centre cohort study um, over the course of two years from 2019 to 2021 um, in patients exactly as I've described earlier. So those without any hemodynamic supports and no ventilatory supports and a reported low risk penicillin allergy. So this is a, a similar um, allergy phenotyping tool that they have used. Um, and I can summarize it as basically saying effectively that low risk group is identical to the one that, um, that would be um, that would be identified through the antibiotic allergy assessment tool. And those patients then proceeded to a single dose amoxicillin oral challenge with a one hour monitoring period thereafter. Um, and some really encouraging results coming out of uh, coming out of this study. So they identified 839 um, allergy labels, um, of whom 240 patients were eligible, so were clinically stable and able to provide a sufficient history to identify them as low risk. Um, 205 of those 240 underwent a direct oral challenge, uh, with only two positive challenges, neither of which had a severe reaction, um, and both were able to be uh, managed with very simple medication. Um, both were simple rashes. Um, and then also importantly, in terms of informing our subsequent questions around, um, around actually developing and deploying a health services program, they were able to, um, they were able to identify 58 patients who then uh, tolerated subsequent doses of penicillins after this initial challenge. Um, and at the end of that two year period, going back and looking through the medical record, they found that uh, the 203 of those 205 had still had that allergy label removed, so they had not reacquired an allergy label or were not thought to uh, to be allergic anymore. Still at the point after two years, so really supporting the robustness of being able to do that delabeling in ICU and still have that message stick. So, summarising the um, summarising the data that we have available to us at the moment, we can see that the the burden is significant within ICU, with greater than sixteen percent um, having an antibiotic allergy label with a penicillin predominance. Um, that the impact is also significant with treatment failures and ICU length of stay. Um, there are certain there are. Um, there are key enablers with a very controlled environment and a real strong clinical desire to be able to optimise care for patients, um, but also some uh, some um, some challenges that really need to be clearly addressed. So, uh, particularly around the impact of critical illness and uh, critical therapies. Um, but encouragingly, some very positive retrospective safety signals from uh, from the initial data that we have. So. What data questions remain though before we're in a position of really deploying a, um, a more established um, health services program? Um, and really that comes down to, are the safety and efficacy signals seen uh, and borne out in prospective randomized data? Um, really better refining what is the impact of critical illness on oral challenge accuracy as well. So, um, so I appreciate that uh, that we have the retrospective data then saying that um, that a, a significant number of patients have been able to go on and receive penicillins after their discharge from ICU, uh, but really looking into that particular question further. Um, but then, and then also further adding to um, 
to the data around the persistence of ICUD labelling. So are we still able to maintain the removal of those, uh, the, those labels that we've taken off in ICU? And so part of the way that we're looking to address this is, is with a, a current pilot RCT um, that I'm uh, that I'm running uh, through a number of sites. So this is exactly that, a safety and feasibility study looking at low risk penicillin allergy in intensive care units um, with a one-to-one -one randomization for direct oral challenge versus routine care. Um, and importantly there, as part of the uh, protocol, we have a repeat challenge post ICU discharge. So rather than relying on only those patients who go on to, to need antibiotics after their ICU stay as, as, a, way of, uh, as a way of identifying whether the, uh, whether the critical illness is really impacting on the accuracy of our oral challenges. Um, in this study, um, any participant who's undertaking an oral challenge in ICU then receives a further oral challenge post ICU discharge to try and more directly answer that question. And then additionally, we have a three month follow up directly with the patient. So not exclusively reliant on the um, electronic medical record um, to look at both the, uh, the robustness of the removal of that label, uh, but then also any further prescribing that's happened after their discharge from hospital. Um, so that's really summarizing the, uh, the key outcomes that we're looking at uh, from, this, from this study. Um, it's up and running now at four sites, so Austin, Melbourne Health, Monash Health and uh, Pedimac, uh, with 42 participants to date and, uh, and really pleasingly excellent ICU engagement at, uh, at each of these sites. That being said though, you know, even with this pilot program running, how can, we, um, how can we look to help patients like Mr. C in the future? And really it's, it's, um, it's looking at deploying a more established routine health service program. And this is really where we're moving into that, uh, that phase of taking the knowledge that we've gained from this data and moving that into, a, uh, into the practice of a, of a program. Um, and the, the key things that we'll need to look at specifically in, uh, in, um, in expanding allergy assessment in critical illness um, is primarily looking at expanding eligibility. So trying to intervene earlier in their ICU stay to actually have an impact on ICU prescribing. So um, looking at patients who are on low dose inotropic support um, or low dose ventilatory support, and also some uh, looking for mechanisms of enhancing our phenotyping. And really what I mean by this is trying to make up for the fact that patients may not be able to give us the most clear history. So it's looking for uh, looking for data from multiple different sources to support the safety or support the identification of a low risk history um, in that setting. Um, and then finally, once we're able to establish a more um, a more established system, being able to sample data, looking at the the true efficacy of the um, of the antibiotic um, assessments in that setting. So, and really, that comes down to the prescribing and the prescribing change that occurs within ICU. Thank you very much. Thanks very much, Morgan. Thank you for a great talk. Uh, we're going to take questions at the end. Uh, so as uh, we've mentioned in the chat, please put any questions you've got in the chat. Uh, we can collate them all and answer them at the end. Uh, so I think the panel discussion will be great. Uh, we're looking forward to the data, Morgan, too, so you can change practice. That would be good. Okay, so the next talk we're going to introduce is somebody that's actually asleep in Canada at the moment. Um, she would love to have joined in person, but has done a talk for us. Her name is Dr. Anna Kapuscu. She's an allergist immunologist at McGill University. She's uh, spent a year or 12 months with us as a uh, allergy immunology drug allergy fellow at the Austin and has subsequently gone on to do a PhD through the University of Melbourne, uh, really examining uh, the approaches and point of care tools for low risk penicillin allergy in a general community and the outpatient setting. And I'm sure she's going to talk about her work today. Um, I think some of her studies, which we hope will come out very soon, are the things that are going to change practice. So um, we're going to... Uh, put... All right. So we're going to do the next introduction. Uh, Joe DeLuca is an allergist immunologist uh, with Austin Health and Royal Melbourne. Uh, he's also a PhD candidate uh, through the University of Melbourne and the Centre of Antibiotic Allergy and Research. Uh, Joe is somebody we've converted from allergy immunology to understand uh, the importance of antibiotics, uh, and I think he's now a steward, I would say. Uh, and he's pretty much looking at training a next generation uh, who can tackle antibiotic allergy, particularly in non-allergist spheres, and, and that's what his PhD is about. Um, he's going to be talking to us today about some of his experience as well, also within this learning system 
framework. So uh, welcome, Joe, and over to you. Thanks, JT. Um, I will share my screen. <clears throat> That's looking OK. Yes, it is. Right. So uh, thanks for the opportunity to talk. This is something I'm very passionate about, um, and I'm sure this talk will reveal how big a nerd I really am. Um, as Jason said, I'm going to be talking about um, antibiotic allergy in the context of learning health systems, and in particular, looking at practice to data. Um, and the title of the talk is Big Data, Bigger Plans. Um, I uh, am going much more grandiose um, with my talk. Uh, it was very good for Morgan to provide a lot of data um, for us to chew over. Um, but I've zoomed out a bit with my talk, so it'll be more of an overview of how antibiotic allergy um, can antibiotic allergy research can be improved through the learning health systems lens. So I'm going to introduce you into very briefly to antibiotic allergy and learning health systems. I'm going to exemplify the practice to data um, segment of learning health systems through three of the studies we're running out of the Center for Antibiotic Allergy and Research. Uh, and then I'll end the talk with looking to the future and what the future looks like in antibiotic allergy research in a learning health systems context. Uh, and spoiler, I think the future is very bright. So I normally uh, talk, uh, start all of my talks about antibiotic allergy, about framing about why do we care about antibiotic allergy and antibiotic allergy, we, we should care about it because it's common, you know, roughly one in 10 patients will have at least one antibiotic allergy. So we'll see it frequently in our patients. And it's probably preaching to the converted here, but um, antibiotic allergy labels have very negative effects on patients just from their mere presence, regardless of whether the patient is actually allergic or not. We know that it ends up, we end up using less efficacious drugs in these patients that are more toxic. Patients with antibiotic allergy labels have more adverse events than those without. They are more likely to carry multi-drug resistant organisms. There's a mortality risk associated with um, antibiotic allergy labels in hospitalized patients, and it costs health services and patients more um, if patients retain antibiotic allergy labels long term. So what this talk really is about instead is why should we care about good quality antibiotic allergy research? Uh, and uh, that's what the thrust of my talk is. And I'm gonna lead you through that now through the lens of learning health uh, systems. And so uh, in, this is the type of cycle we'll see. And you may have seen already with a number of the talks um, throughout the um, Antibiotic Allergy Week um, symposia. And so we've had, um, Morgan uh, present on data to knowledge. Uh, we would have heard uh, Anna speak about converting that knowledge and leading that to practice change. And so what I'm talking about is taking practice and how you generate data from that practice in a way that then feeds the rest of the cycle in a way that actually impacts practice when you come back to it. And in my opinion, I think this part of the learning health system cycle is probably the most fundamentally important to get right so that the rest of the cycle then leads to significant impacts and changes to practice at the end. And so antibiotic allergy research historically to date has had many limitations and there's been very slow change to practice um, previously. Um, and that's mostly been limited to uh, been limited as a result of relatively low quality studies compared to other specialties and other research fields out there. It really, antibiotic allergy research very much relies on retrospective and or observational studies. Um, historically, there's been a limited combining of data sets and combining of data from across multiple centers or across um, borders. Uh, and thus a lot of the studies have very small numbers. Um, our understanding of the impacts of antibiotic allergy labels and the interventions like delabeling uh, at the level of associations at best, again, due to um, the limitations on study design in this particular field. And one of the really big limitations for uh, this research is that there's significant heterogeneity between centers, between countries, even just in naming the allergic reactions or the diseases we see 
heterogeneity in definitions of how you define um, a particular disease, um, uh, how you test, what concentrations you used, what type of testing you use, is it laboratory testing, is it in vivo testing, uh, and even in phenotyping, people are doing using different tools across different countries. So it really has unfortunately ham hampered the advancement of antibiotic allergy, re uh, antibiotic allergy research to date. And so where have we gone wrong? Why are we where we, where we have been? Um, you know, I think health environments are complex um, and that means that uh, the approach to practice in antibiotic allergy as a result is different between hospital states and countries and it's very difficult to standardise um, as a result, if your health care system has done things a certain way for a long time. And so I really want to frame where we've gone wrong to date in the learning health system cycle itself. And so when we start with looking at practice to data, as I've kind of already alluded to, practice really differs based on geography or what was already historically done due to um, expert consensus or what that what that site or um, healthcare centre always did. And so they continue to do it. And so that differs based on geography, based on healthcare networks, based on country. And so because that, the data generated from that is very specific to those contexts. And so that means that the knowledge derived from that data is limited in its generalizability, which means that when you come back to then changing practice, there's minimal impact to ongoing practice in a generalised way across countries, um, across states within countries, uh, which means that a lot of the time for antibiotic allergy research, um, it, it's when we look at things like guideline development um, or driving um, uh, national uh, guidelines, it, 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 there's been not a huge impact and it relies on a lot of expert uh, consensus as well. And so this is summarized very well in um, informatics, in a, with a concept that's known as garbage in, garbage out. So if you have garbage data going in, regardless of all the beautiful analysis you do, unfortunately, um, the garbage, the the output that comes from that is going to be garbage. Maybe it's a little bit harsh to say it that way, but I think you get my drift. And so this part of the learning health system cycle and um, practice to data is all about leveraging practice with data systems. Uh, and as I said, I think it's really fundamental that you get that we get the that part right so that the data generated is very much usable, practical, and then will be able to be applied at the end back to practice. And so the majority of what I'm gonna talk about today is gonna to be about uh, some novel approaches to data collection that we have in practice through the Center for Antibiotic Allergy and Research through three of our studies. So I'm gonna be look, talking about how we leverage multi-center studies in rare conditions like OSCAR with increased complexity of data collection. We're going to talk about utilisation of um, modern technologies like smartphone apps in the PREPARE study, and then combining those two approaches in a large data set with the NAN database as well. And so starting with OSCAR, so some people in, this, in the audience may be familiar with uh, OSCAR. Um, when we're talking about SCAR for some context and some background, what we, what we mean by SCAR is it's that they're severe cutaneous adverse reactions. They are severe. They have really la potentially lasting impacts uh, on patients um, and includes three major disease groups, SJS, TEN, which causes quite significant burn-like um, changes, uh, both to the cutaneous and mucocutaneous um, uh, areas, um, and, uh, including eyes, mouth, uh, genital area. We've got dress, um, which uh, can cause quite significant organ involvement um, that can lead to organ failure. And, uh, and it's also known as drug reaction, the eosinophilia and systemic symptoms. And they've got AGEP um, or acute generalized exanthematous pustulosis, a pustular type rash that can also lead to organ involvement as well. The majority of the time uh, in these uh, conditions, it's caused by a drug exposure. So it's an allergic response to a drug. Um, and one of the challenges to date in um, research around scars that they're very rare diseases. So when you look at SJSTN, for example, we might see, you know, four, five patients in the whole of Victoria um, in one year, which means collecting data in a standardized way that's useful for research is going to be very slow if you do it in a single center. Um, 
and uh, it makes it very challenging. And so one of the problems with um, research around SCAR to date is that it's quite complex. And um, we look at things like, we look at research questions like, what is the risk of someone developing a SCAR to a particular drug? Um, how do we identify the causal drugs in someone who's had multiple drugs all at once? Um, how do we identify um, uh, good treatments? And how do we identify pathogenesis? But the problem is, is that they each compound on each other. So um, when we're looking at causal drugs, how do we identify causal drugs? It's modulated by risk. It depends on the drug itself. Um, the testing itself uh, almost certainly depends on the disease, whether it was SJS, DRESS or AGEP, and what their underlying risk was. Uh, when you look at pathogenesis, it's going to be dependent on the actual drug itself and the underlying risk. And then again, it is um, compounded again when you look at what treatments work. Well, it probably depends on the underlying pathogenesis and the underlying uh, immune mechanisms. It's going to depend on the actual particular drug at the time. That's going to depend on their underlying genetic risk. So it's a very complex uh, group of questions that we have for this group of diseases, which are rare. And so to give you an overview of what OSCAR is, so it's a prospective clinical and uh, um, biobank registry, looking at both phenotypic and immunotypic or genotypic data. Um, and it's leveraging, uh, uh, it's, it's utilizing a, a multi-center approach that we can collate cases in a way where you get large enough numbers that you can then look at patterns uh, of phenotype, uh, immunotype, and genotype in these particular patients across um, SJST and AGEP DRESS uh, as well. And so the first part of the study is a collection of clinical and genomic data. Um, so clinical data through uh, EMR mining um, and then the phenotypic and prescribing data that's collected for those patients, uh, as well as also collecting saliva for DNA to try and identify underlying risk. Uh, and then the second part is the immunolog immunological studies. So that's collection of samples from patients um, or participants, including PBMCs, skin and blister fluid to carry out um, immunotypic uh, studies as well. And so um, what the focus of OSCAR is, is really looking at translational solutions in a way that can we it's important that we um, collect the right data so that in the end, we can look at translational solutions for all those questions that I've already talked about. So uh, these are the questions that I've gone through already. So looking at causality, pathogenesis, what treatments work, what, out, what the patient outcomes are in the natural history of disease or with particular treatments, looking at pharmacogenomic predictors and how can we better diagnose the condition itself and also what particular causal drug was um, involved for that particular patient, either in the laboratory or through in vivo skin testing. Okay, so that uh, gives you an idea of um, some of the data uh, uh, collection that we're doing in practice in a uh, rare um, in rare diseases with complex um, uh, questions. And so I'm going to bring you now to PREPARE, which is a bit of a precursor to NAN as well. The PREPARE study is looking at perioperative risk assessment and delabeling and is part, forms part of my PhD, so it's a little bit my baby. Um, and the inspiration for PREPARE was uh, the fact that access to allergy services are so limited currently, and it's limited by allergists. Um, there are limited allergy services and limited allergists to provide those services which means there's huge bottlenecking occurring um, for these patients. Um, and when you think about the prevalence of antibiotic allergy labels, the bottlenecking would be even worse if all patients with antibiotic allergy labels were referred to us uh, through the hospitals. And so the, uh, the driving question behind PREPARE is can antibiotic allergy delabeling be carried out by non-allergist specialty groups safely? And so, um, we really wanted to look at outsourcing risk stratification to anaesthetists in the perioperative period um, and try and improve access to beta-lactam antibiotics perioperatively as well. It's a prospective multi-center pilot RCT. And as I mentioned earlier, it's utilizing a smartphone app 
to carry out and guide the non-allergist, the anaesthetist, through an allergy history and then risk stratifying the patient based on that. Um, it is we're recruiting surgical patients who are attending a preoperative assessment clinic um, who have a beta lactam allergy label identified. As I said, it's a pilot RCT, so patients are randomized to control, where, which is standard of care, um, where the antibiotic allergy label is left intact and they proceed to surgery and we look at their outcomes. Uh, versus the intervention arm, which is where the anaesthetist uses the app to do the risk stratification. Patients are stratified to either low or high risk. Uh, and those who are low risk have an in clinic, uh, straight after their appointment with the anaesthetist, have an in clinic oral challenge to a penicillin or cephalosporin for delabeling prior to surgery. We'll then follow them up after surgery to look at um, how they did after surgery from an outcomes point of view. Those who are identified as high risk, wherever possible, we'll get them urgently done, uh, urgently seen in the allergy clinic so we can carry out um, allergy testing like skin testing and if appropriate delabeling. Um, uh, again, all prior to surgery to see how that how that then impacts surgery as well. And so I've already kind of talked about the outcomes. It's the primary outcomes here are looking at feasibility. Can this be done? And is it safe to do? So safety. Uh, but we are looking at a number of secondary outcomes. Here's a short list. There's like 20 secondary outcomes in the study. Um, and these are AMS relevant um, outcomes. So beta lactam utilization, surgical site infections, so on and so forth. And so the bones of uh, the app for Prepare, um, Morgan has uh, already gone over. It's this antibiotic allergy assessment tool that was derived um, from, the, uh, from, from the Center for Antibiotic Allergy and Research. Um, and, and it takes this paper form for risk assessment and turns it into an app, whilst also guiding in a logical way, guiding a non-allergist through um, history taking for allergy. And I have the app to show you. Well, this is a video of the app. So uh, the anaesthetist will put in the name of the penicillin, uh, the name of the uh, B-lactam the patient is allergic to. It then gives them a series of questions they can ask the patient um, that is all about phenotyping. So it's trying to assess what is the likely phenotype here based on the questions answered. Um, and then also ask some questions around risk. So how long ago did it occur? Were they hospitalized? Did they need treatment? Uh, and at the end, the app will provide a uh, risk stratification outcome and has the potential to provide a um, uh, 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 recommendation as well. Uh, the great thing about the uh, app is we're leveraging this technology so that we can then, uh, when, the, when we hit save, once the assessment's been done, there's an immediate data transfer to REDCap at the, straight into the database. So there's no double handling that needs to be done. There's no data entry that needs to be done separately, which leads to errors. So um, a great way of, in two directions, helping someone take an allergy history who might not know how to do that, but also being able to collect that data in a way that we can then utilize and analyze um, down the track. So uh, that brings us to the National Antibiotic Allergy Network. Um, which does something similar. The NAND database does something similar using a smartphone application that's been souped up um, compared to the PREPARE app. The National Antibiotic Allergy Network is a collaborative network of key stakeholders uh, across specialties and craft groups that is designed to enable collation, development and sharing of um, uh, antimicrobial allergy resources, particularly with an AMS focus, um, which is very good. Um, I think for those who maybe aren't very familiar with AMS um, approaches, if you think about allergists, potential policymakers, uh, uh, so on and so forth. And really, I think one of the great benefits of NAN is that it's a platform to really provide health services support to implement antibiotic allergy programs and scale up um, antibiotic allergy programs with a variety of different um, experiences and comfort when it comes to antibiotic allergy assessment. Uh, and uh, relevant to this talk, it then allows for a framework so that we can collaborate uh, with health services research across in a national context and really form a national database for antibiotic allergy testing, something that's never been done uh, in Australia before. This is the NAN database team of which I'm a part of. It's led by Jason Triviano, who's the chief investigator, and uh, Fiona James and Elise Mitri. 
um, both managers uh, on the project. And then we've got IT support from Luke Fletcher, who's developed uh, the app and API to Redcap uh, for us. Uh, and then uh, Maureen Turner, who's involved from Biogrid as well, who's the third party database, who's gonna be the repository of this data. Uh, and there's been plenty of EOIs from around Australia for uh, the NAN database, which is really excellent to see. So many um, hospitals around the country keen to participate. And so NAN and the NAN database has been designed to really address the gaps in Australian penicillin allergy. You know, it's I think this is still a bit of a gray area in terms of meeting national standards around adverse reactions to antimicrobials. Um, uh, how we implement uh, antibiotic allergy uh, assessment and delabeling into AMS practice and understanding, uh, understanding national outcomes and practice as well. So in a standardized way, assessing what challenge protocols being utilized and what phenotypes, what are the outcomes in patients being challenged, what is the actual impact on AMS and health outcomes uh, and help uh, um, create a platform for national data to then inform national guidelines and policy, uh, which has been a gap so far, for sure. It's an ethical, it's an ethics approved database of penicillin allergy and assessment through the Austin HREC. Um, and in particular, it's looking at auditing, uh, the database is looking at auditing inpatient penicillin programs at the participating sites. Hospitals can use um, uh, their own guidelines for assessment and challenge if that's in place, or there's a toolkit that can be provided for those who don't have that in place. And then the really important thing that's relevant to the learning health systems and practice to data is that data is collected by a standardized assessment tool using a smartphone app uh, similar to Prepare um, with database linkage. Again, here, what we're looking at is um, from an outcomes point of view is a percent of a percentage of patients discovered with a low risk penicillin allergy that are delabeled with direct challenge, and then a number of secondary outcomes relevant to AMS, AMR, and health services outcomes as well. So the app, similar to Prepare, um, has a login page and also has uh, an outcome, a phenotypic assessment at the end. Uh, but what how we get there is a bit more uh, advanced than what we had with Prepare. So it allows for site-specific um, data to be entered. Uh, it allows for more than just the actual assessment uh, data to be collected. It allows for medical history uh, and also uh, challenge data to be collected as well, um, which is uh, different to prepare. Uh, the key data fields, oh, and, and similarly, having direct connection between the app, once you press save, the app, and then uh, an API that then means that that data is instantly collected through to the database as well. Um, the key data fields that we're going to have all sites um, look at are uh, patient age, sex, location, the antibiotic allergy assessment, the phenotypic score or PENFAST, and the penicillin oral challenge if it's been performed, and then bonus data, which would be great to help inform those um, AMS, AMR outcomes are things like admission data, antibiotic usage, so on and so forth. Uh, and so, as I said, the NAN data is going to be stored in a purpose-built red cap hosted by Biogrid. So Biogrid is a trusted third party who is part of the um, uh, ethics application um, as a contractor of Austin Health. The data is stored centrally, de-identified, but has the ability for individual sites to re-identify their own patients if they need to for clinical reasons. And so one of the great things about this is that those reports can be, that uh, reports can be provided um, to sites so that they can then use it themselves for audit purposes, management reporting, um, and changing their own practice as well. And so looking at the timeline for NAN, um, uh, we've been engaging in site engagement uh, at the moment, at the start of next year, first uh, three um, quarters of next year, looking at expanding nationally across sites and rolling out. Uh, and then at the fourth quarter next year, looking at international expansion as well. And it'd be really fantastic to have an international standardized database for antibiotic allergy delabeling and assessment. And so looking at the scope, and this is gonna lead me into talking about the future. 
looking at the scope of the NAND database, it has both a local, regional and international scope, which I think is really exciting. As I said, it enables local health services to order and feedback and change their own practice and, uh, if needed at the time. So it allows for that quality improvement. Uh, it allows from a regional point of view, an Australia-wide uh, point, point of view, to allows us to inform national policy and hospital standards and really assess the impact of national interventions, um, which is very exciting. And then internationally, if we have international sites on board um, and we have friends in um, South Africa who are very keen to take part already, uh, looking at international link linkage studies and collaboration to really examine big data outcomes uh, as well. So that brings me to the future. Uh, as I said, I think the future is bright. It's very exciting. I think we're in a very exciting space for antibiotic allergy. Um, and uh, it's just as exciting as a robot playing in the trumpet. First thing, I, I alluded to data linkage um, earlier at the end of the NAN summary. Uh, and for those who aren't aware, data linkage, what it does is it allows for keeping of the same information altogether for a particular patient at large scales and complexity. So if you think about diagnostic data, phenotypic data, testing, pathogenesis and pharmacogenomic data, that's very a very complex data set that you'd be collecting for that patient if it was in one specific database for one specific center. And then if you think about expanding that to multiple centers, it's very challenging. Um, so what this allows you to do, what data linkage allows you to do is then attach that to that one patient so that that way, if a particular site um, wants to look at studying phenotypic data versus pharmacogenomics and what the what how those two relate to each other that can happen so on and so forth and so really what we're what i'm talking about here is big data and big when we talk about big data we're talking about complex data sets and large data sets um, both of which have not really been a feature of antibiotic allergy research due to the limitations i talked about earlier and I think we're really getting into some exciting spaces with our studies at the Center for Antibiotic Allergy and Research because we're creating, we're looking at creating a large data set with the National Antibiotic Allergy Network, and we've got quite a complex data set for OSCAR uh, as well. And so one of the things that really excites me is looking at machine lear learning, you know, utilizing um, current technologies, which healthcare systems really don't use very well when you think about other um other, other industries. Um, and so when you've got big complex data sets, using typical or standard analytic techniques is very challenging. So if we can leverage uh, artificial intelligence and machine learning to help us understand those data sets, I think uh, that's, where, uh, that's where we really get to see some real future um, stuff. And so things that machine learning can do, it can help us identify patterns in these co large complex data sets identify um, factors within patients, either phenotypic or pharmacogenomic or um, testing data that helps us form decision tools around antibiotic allergy. It helps us enhance our testing and identify what combinations of testing um, really helps identify causal agents or causal antimicrobials. It helps with surveillance and certainly could help with prediction, even if we could, you know, predicting ahead of time, which patients are likely to develop a reaction or an allergy to a particular antimicrobial. And so when we talk about big data analytics and machine learning, this is really what we're talking about. And I think really is where the practice to data side really comes in um, in a learning health system, from a learning health system point of view. And so if we look at this uh, um, image where we've got a collection of data into a data warehouse, uh, for example, the data warehouse and biogroup for NAN, um, that really is an example of practice to data where we're collecting, pra collecting practice data um, uh, uh, into a central repository. You've then got data to knowledge where you've got analytics, potential use of machine learning um, uh, it, it, that generates knowledge that can then be, uh, we can then have improved knowledge that leads to better quality research output, um, which I think is very exciting. Again, with big data and with machine learning, it's really important that, you know, caution is required. What we, I talked about in terms of garbage in, garbage out certainly applies to this space. So that's why getting that, that um, practice to data right is really critical um, to make sure that the data we get 
at the end and the knowledge we get at the end is applicable to our practice. And so that's my talk. Um, I said it was going to be grandiose. I hope you found it very helpful. Um, uh, in summary, learning health systems present opportunities um, for better quality allergy research that can change practice. I think capturing the right data from practice is key to enhance the impacts of the rest of the learning health system cycle and you know that concept of garbage in, garbage out. I've presented three innovative studies from the Center for Antibiotic Allergy Research that I think is very exciting. Um, OSCAR, which captures complex data in rare conditions at a large, larger scale than we have in the past. Prepare, which has this two-way effect of the app in terms of leading a history uh, in someone who doesn't know how to do an allergy history, but also in uh, enhancing data capture. Uh, and also NAN, so looking at capturing these large standardized data sets for antibiotic allergy on a national scale or an international scale, potentially, which we haven't prior. Uh, and uh, big data analytics really provides exciting avenues for better uh, drug allergy research as well. I wanna thank our group who are fantastic. They're a great team who I love working with uh, and we're all passionate uh, about this particular area. So thank you, CAR team. And I'm happy to take any questions during the panel. Thank you, Joseph. Great talk. Very inspiring. Um, I think it's what we're trying to aim towards. Uh, certainly would have been nice to end with this talk, but we're going to go back to Anna's talk now. Uh, and hopefully we'll be able to quiz you about how we translate some of that at the end of the panel discussion. But um, I think we'll go back. Uh, for those that weren't here earlier, we were going to go to Anna Kapasku's talk from Canada, uh, but we had some technical difficulties, so we're going to try and launch that now. Hello, my name is Anna Kopescu. I am a PhD candidate at the University of Melbourne and the Center for Antibiotic Allergy and Research at the Austin Health. I also work as a physician scientist in allergy immunology at the McGill University Health Center in Montreal, Canada. I'm very happy to discuss the knowledge to practice aspect and specifically focus on clinical decision rules to delabel drug allergy in your practice. I have received grants and scholarships from the University of Melbourne, the Montreal General Hospital Foundation, and the Research Institute of the McGill University Health Center. First, a quick introduction on the learning health systems approach and specifically knowledge to practice. The first step is to identify and clarify the problem. Following this crucial step, one must design a digital health solution. Further, one must also map and specify the solution components, and this leads to the prototype and development and testing of the solution. The ultimate goal here is to make knowledge actionable and shareable, as well as generate tailored messages in order to make decisions or for decision making. In terms of the plan, we'll talk about the PenFast 4 and our currently ongoing trial. We will address how we can use this tool in various populations, as well as other non-penicillin drugs. And finally, a short dive into the future. So let's get started. Let's identify and clarify the problem. Our main problem is antibiotic allergy. This comes as no surprise that penicillins are one of the most common agents implicated in drug allergy. Penicillin allergy is reported by the electronic medical record. It's described in about 10% of our patients. However, the true prevalence of penicillin allergy among those with a penicillin allergy label is likely only 2%. In patients that have a good clinical history and positive skin tests of penicillin, there is actually evidence to suggest that allergy wanes with time. Also, we know that any organ can be involved, but skin is most commonly affected. We also know that penicillin allergy labels lead to a greater use of broad spectrum alternative antibiotics. The use of these broad spectrum antibiotics is associated with higher healthcare costs, increased antibiotic resistance. This can lead to higher rates of treatment failure. It is associated sometimes with medication errors, can cause undesirable side effects, and finally, increase the risk of hospital-related complications. I wanted to briefly mention some of the current available investigations in drug allergy. The prick skin testing involves adding a drop of drug and with a small prick gently piercing the skin, a positive reaction is translated by redness and a local reaction as you can see in the image. 
In terms of the intradermal testing, the drug is injected just under the skin, as you can also see. And we know that following skin testing, more than 85% of all penicillin allergy labels can be removed. Following a negative skin test, the allergy can also be ruled out with a drug challenge. The target dose is administered under the supervision of a physician that is trained to recognize and treat anaphylaxis. And we also know that this procedure is indicated usually for low risk patients that are considered unlikely to be allergic. When a patient completes a challenge or a test dose without any reaction, this shows that there is no immediate drug allergy. And in this context, we actually remove the allergy label and we call this delabeling. We know that 96 to 99% of low risk penicillin allergies can be removed following a negative oral challenge. So what could be an interesting digital health solution for this important problem? In this article, Dr. Trubiano aimed to understand if a clinical decision rule can risk stratify penicillin allergies and identify low-risk phenotypes aiming point-of-care delabeling. A multi-center prospective cohort uh, composed of 622 patients from two sites in Melbourne, Australia, was used for internal validation. The external validation was performed in a retrospective penicillin allergy-tested cohort and in this cohort, there were 945 patients from both Australia and the United States. The PENFAST tool was validated as a novel clinician decision rule, and this aimed to facilitate point of care risk assessment in terms of patient reported penicillin allergies. The score identified low risk penicillin allergies with a negative predictive value of 96%. So let's carefully look at this score. The PENFAST score requires three clinical criteria, time, five years or less from the penicillin allergy episode, and there are two points that are attributed for this. The phenotype, there is anaphylaxis, angioedema, or the severe cutaneous adverse reactions, and two other points are attributed for either of these phenotypes. Treatment required or unknown, and this um, criteria uh, is administered one point. The risk of a positive penicillin allergy test can be accurately predicted based on this criteria, as you can see on the right side of the slide. So zero points, this is a very low risk of positive penicillin allergy test, less than 1%. One to two points, we're talking about a low risk, about 5%. Three points, a moderate risk up to 20%. And finally, the high risk, this is up to 50%. In this context, we know that a score of less than three is associated with a high negative predictive value of having a negative a penicillin allergy investigation. So for the rest of the presentation, we'll actually focus on testing the digital health solution. This European study aimed to validate the PENFAST clinical decision rule in a population with high risk of suspected immediate amoxicillin allergy. The authors here retrospectively analyzed medical records of patients that had a suspected immediate amoxicillin allergy, and they had an allergy evaluation by a specialist in the allergy unit at the Strasbourg uh, University Hospital, and the authors aimed to internally validate the PENFAST in their center. They studied 142 adults from 2015 to 2020. The majority of the adults were women with a median age of 52, and most of them reported a reaction that was consistent with anaphylaxis. The internal validation of PENFAST score revealed a good discrimination with an area under the curve of 0.86. A cutoff of less than three points for the PENFAST was used uh, to classify 29 out of the 142 patients as low risk allergy. Among these, as you can see, only two received the positive results following allergy testing, and the negative predictive value for a successful delabeling was 0.93. In this European cohort of patients that mainly reported anaphylaxis, the PENFAST was validated to identify low risk penicillin allergies. And this study uh, published in January of 2020 is the first reported external validation of the PENFAST rule internationally. 
We also have an ongoing study, the PALIS, or the use of a penicillin allergy clinical decision rule to enable direct oral penicillin challenge. And this is a multi-center, non-impurity randomized controlled trial. The main question is, do we need to perform skin testing for patients that have a low risk penicillin allergy as defined by PENFAST score of less than three? In other words, we aim to evaluate the non-inferiority of direct oral challenge when we compare it to current standard of care, which is skin testing and challenge if the skin testing is negative. As mentioned, an international multicenter non-inferiority randomized clinical trial. There are three sites in Australia. In the US, there are two sites implicated, and finally, our institution in Canada. Participants are currently being randomized one-to-one -to, -one to either skin testing followed by oral challenge if the skin testing is negative or direct oral challenge. The randomization is stratified by clinical site and the sample size that is aim is 380 patients. The recruitment is currently ongoing with 372 patients recruited today. This ability to deliver point of care penicillin allergy investigations for a large part of patients without the need of skin testing will improve patient access to testing and the use of preferred penicillin antibiotics. And we hope that the data collected from all the recruiting centers will be analyzed uh, together and could serve for local practice change in the implicated hospitals, but might also be considered as part of new drug allergy guidelines. So our trial focuses on an adult outpatient population. Let's now go back to the PENFAST score and see to what type of patients this, this score could also be applied for. When looking at the populations and the clinical settings, we will focus on pregnant females, the pediatric setting, and review how this tool could be implemented in the emergency department. So let's start with pregnant patients. This is a recent study from British Columbia, Canada, published in the Journal of Allergy and Clinical Immunology in Practice in July of this year. As the title states, the main objectives, uh, objective was to assess the safety and impact of penicillin allergy evaluation in pregnant patients. They included pregnant women in their third trimester, 28 to 30 uh, 36 weeks of pregnancy with a history of penicillin allergy who planned to deliver at the institution. Based on the history, patients were stratified into low, medium, and high-risk groups. Patients with a PENFAST score of zero were classified as very low risk. Scores one to three were grouped as medium, and finally four to five deemed high risk. The patients that were low risks were off low risk were offered direct oral challenge with a dose of amoxicillin 500 milligrams. Between July of 2019 and September of 2021, 245 pregnant patients were enrolled and assessed. A total of 216 were deemed to be low risk. 207 underwent direct oral challenge and nine were labeled based on history alone. 28 uh, females were considered medium risk and they underwent skin testing before oral challenge. Of these 28, two had equivocal skin test and received no further challenge, and the rest received oral challenge without any reaction. One patient was excluded uh, from testing because of being scored high risk. So as we saw, the use of a risk stratification tool allows for point of care assessment of testing eligibility in pregnancy, Direct oral challenge is safe and effective in the labeling penicillin allergies in the obstetric population. And finally, pregnancy does not modify one's risk score and should not represent a barrier to direct oral challenge in the setting of an allergy assessment. Moving forward, as the title indicates, the purpose of this second study was to implement the PENFAST penicillin allergy screening tool in the emergency department and to identify low-risk patients with inappropriate penicillin-related allergies. During routine medication evaluations, pharmacists identified patients that had a documented penicillin-related allergy in their electronic medical records, and they used the PENFAST screening tool. Patients meeting inclusion criteria had their penicillin-related allergy updated in the electronic record, and following the assessment, the risk categories were 
uh, very low, low, moderate, or high. The primary outcome for this study were the percentage of patients screened that were classified as very low and low risk, as well as the percentage of penicillin-related allergies that were updated in the electronic medical record. The secondary outcomes are the percentage of patients that required antibiotic therapy after the allergy update in the files, and how many of them were changed to a beta-lactam antibiotic. They also looked at the inpatient broad-spectrum antibiotic use before and after the allergy update, and finally, the time spent interviewing each patient with the PENFAS. A total of 59 patients were interviewed using the PENFAST tool. The results indicated that 92% of the 54 uh, patient allergies were updated in the electronic medical record. Further, you can see that 13 patients were classified as very low risk and 18 low risk. Among the 36 patients that were on a non beta lactam antibiotic, 72% were changed to a beta-lactam following this evaluation, and the average time to complete the PENFAST was 4.2 minutes. In summary, another success story for the PENFAST as underlined by this tweet. Let's now look at the pediatric population. The aim of our cohort study was to examine the previously validated PENFAST adult score in children. Using a Canadian prospective pediatric cohort from three centers, we examined the PENFAST score in 2,028 children that had 2,031 penicillin allergy labels. Data was collected from August of 2011 to March 2021. The median age for uh, these children included in the cohort was 4.3 years with mostly male participants. The most reported reaction occurred in the past five years or at an unknown time. Anaphylaxis and angioedema were reported in 221 uh, patients. There were no scar cases. And in terms of the treatment or unknown treatment, this was administered for 60% uh, of the cases. Using the published adult PENFAST score um, and with the cutoff of three or greater, the area under the curve was 0.51, and the specificity and sensitivity were 57 and 45% respectively. The negative predictive value was 95%, which was actually considered poor in the context of a low prevalence of a positive challenge for this cohort. And when the tool was used in children that were 13 years or older, the area under the curve was 0.622. So in this Canadian Pediatric Prospective Multicenter cohort, the PENFAST tool did not help identify low-risk penicillin allergies. And this previously validated tool and an adult population, as we saw, was not useful for risk stratification in children that were younger than 12 years of age. In teenagers, so more than 13, the predictive ability of the tool increased and there was a higher area under the curve, specificity, and a higher negative predictive value, but a lower sensitivity. But this also could indicate that the tool could have some value in this population uh, following the study of larger cohorts. So let's now see if we can apply the PENFAST to other drugs. And we'll focus specifically on the sulfamitaxazole and trimetoprim. This is a study currently pending publication on the development and validation of a sulfa antibiotic allergy clinical decision rule. The aim here is to validate the PENFAST tool for uh, the TMP SMX. In terms of the methods, the authors used the previously validated PENFAST in two independent international data sets in the Australia and the United States for validation for a TMP SMX allergy clinical decision rule that they called the NFAS, the SFAS. They included adult patients they had that had a non-severe allergy and excluded recent reports of anaphylaxis, and this is within five years, and they also excluded SCAR. The initial Australian validation cohort consisted of 100 patients, and the prevalence of a positive TMPSMX allergy was 7%. 
The American cohort had 204 patients and the prevalence was similar at 6.4%. Using the same criteria as, as the PENFAS, the model showed here good discrimination in determining true TMPS and mixed allergy with an area under the curve of 0.76. A cutoff of less than three was cho chosen um, and this helped classify 92 of the 100 patients as low risk allergy. Three patients among these tested positive two were positive during direct oral challenge and one during a prolonged oral challenge and all three presented non-severe skin eruptions. So in terms of the study, the, the SFAST tool has potential utility to identify low risk individuals that do not have true TMP SMX allergy. And of course, further uh, international court studies are required for greater implementation. I will briefly address future research possibilities. Future studies are needed to validate this tool in different populations, such as our acutely ill, the adolescents, and the geriatric population. Indeed, population aging is a global phenomenon with an estimate of over 720 million individuals aged 65 years and older worldwide. There are currently limitations to the PENFAST rules, such as the, as the exclusion of non-penicillin beta-lactam allergies, as well as the exclusion of intravenous penicillins. And further studies can uh, help us extrapolate this tool to other commonly prescribed medications, such as cephalosporins. So in conclusion, PENFAST is internally and externally validated to identify low-risk penicillin allergies. Our, un our ongoing randomized clinical trial PALIS will improve patient access to testing and the use of preferred penicillin antibiotics. The use of this risk stratification tool, the PENFAST, allows for point of care assessment for penicillin allergy testing in pregnancy. This score can also improve outcomes in the emergency department. And finally, the SFAST tool has potential utility for identifying low risk uh, TMP SMX allergies. So I'd like to thank um, all of the different collaborators and particularly I'd like to thank my mentors and supervisor, Dr. Trubiano, Dr. Holmes, Dr. Ben Shushan, and Dr. Phillips. I'm very fortunate to be part of the Austin Health family. As already mentioned, we have some funding for our studies from my institution, the University of Melbourne and the Austin Health. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Anna. Uh, it was a very good talk too. And for everybody on the line, um, we've got 10 patients to go for Palace. So hopefully we'll be able to have the results out, maybe on Twitter if it's still here uh, before it gets out in publication, but hopefully so. Um, okay, so I guess we're gonna move on to the panel section now. Uh, so we're going to invite those that are around, uh, Joe, Elise, Morgan. Oh, Kaz is here too. Very good. Um, to ask some questions, I guess, of the audience. Now, before I go to, uh, please, if you've got questions in the audience, put them in the chat now because we can moderate those and flick them. Um, I think Felicia has been uh, answered by uh, Joe DeLuca. So that's, um, well, you're going to discuss that now. Maybe we'll go to that question first, Joe. So uh, Felicia Devchan, now I'm gonna call that out. She works for Therapeutic Guidelines um, and is the sister of the famous Devchan paper, which is the antibiotic allergy assessment paper. So some inside knowledge there. Uh, in terms of the app, which Joe has developed, can you use the app for patients with a penicillin allergy but can't recall the specific penicillin? Uh, Joe, do you wanna take that one? Yeah, so I said in the chat that the short answer is yes. So. The bones of the app are in that paper antibiotic allergy assessment tool. And within that tool, there is a provision for if someone doesn't know their history. So um, there is a way that um, as long as they say it was a penicillin, but I don't know what penicillin, and we have an option for penicillin unspecified and, and it's um, those with an unknown uh, history or can't recall the specific penicillin that's been built into um, those tools. Fantastic. Um, 
I might just before we get some bigger question, uh, some bigger sort of topics and bigger picture questions going, I'm sure Kaz will jump in with those. But Elise, I would say, I reckon 70% of the participants online will be pharmacists. I know I'm having a guess here, but it's huge. So what do you think the role is for the pharmacist right now in antibiotic allergy programs? And maybe what going into the future, what, what is your perspective on that? Thanks, Jason. Um, I think that pharmacists both in hospital and community settings have a really big role to play in penicillin allergy in the future and also at optimising antimicrobial prescribing in this setting. Um, so I guess looking at, you know, the initial assessment of penicillin allergy, that's something that many health professionals or disciplines can do and looking at direct delabeling of those type A adverse drug reactions. Um, of course, with patient and prescriber education to ensure ongoing sustainability of the delabeling process. And then if an immune mediated penicillin allergy is identified, sort of looking at avenues for appropriate referral to allergy specialists, ID physicians for you know, specialized antibiotic allergy testing. And then looking at our colleagues overseas, we're seeing pharmacists driving um, a lot of the penicillin allergy assessment and sort of low risk delabeling processes over there. So I think in Australia, we've got a real potential for future roles for pharm you know, credentialed pharmacists led um, low risk allergy assessing uh, assessing and testing of allergies and particularly in the low risk setting and also sort of in specialized environments so in hospitals um, you know with a lot of ID and allergy immunology support around so I, th I think pharmacists have a really big role to play um, and I think they can become part of that you know that allergy framework you know it's multidisciplinary and, and there is a big role to play. It'd be nice to see, you know, all um, non allergist pharmacists and nursing run low risk clinics in the future. There's no reason why we can't have nurse practitioners, pharmacists with, you know, credential programs doing this. Um, Morgan? I think it's just worth mentioning on that front from the ICU perspective. So the biggest data that we have on direct oral challenges in ICU is the paper out of the US, and that's a pharmacist-led program of identifying those individuals, identifying low risk, and then um, and then facilitating the uh, the direct oral challenge. So it's a it's a really great example. It's a bit embarrassing. The Americans are better than us in AMS in some regards. This can't this can't go on, can it, Kaz? I'm just coming back to the, you know, we started off using the learning health framework. And uh, one of the questions I always get asked is, well, we don't know how to start or where do we start or what do we do? I mean, I really want to do this in my organisation, but I just don't know where to start. And I think something that perhaps been missed even on Fridays is the, the importance of, of forming what we call the learning health community. And when we talk about the learning health community, then that is identifying um, everyone in your organisation that you think is going to be essential to be able to get your project underway. Now, that might be as high up as the CEO or Chief Medical Officer. Um, it means making sure that you've got um, senior clinicians who agree to support your project, uh, head of pharmacy, um, your that some of your fellow um, pharmacists, you know, it's not, it's not uncommon in stewardship that while there might be some very keen pharmacists, there are other pharmacists that maybe don't see the value of an intervention and can and sort of, you know, maybe hold you back and clinician, and that this of course holds for clinicians as well. And then of course nurses who nurses are the coordinators of care. So you must never forget how important nurses are in terms of engaging them with programs. And in fact, in our experience, particularly at um, Peter Map with the projects, the nurses are absolutely essential. And of course we have developed an advanced nursing practitioner role. Linda Lambros, who's actually now doing skin prick testing and, and assisting in the allergy clinic. So this learning health community is a first step to really getting going. Then, of course, Jason and the team have actually built out an incredible set. They've essentially built out all the toolkit out for what you what you need to use. Um, and then the second piece is adapting that for your own organisation. There is no single program for allergy labelling that is plug and play. It can never happen. No, there is no 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 clinical pathway that's plug and play it'd be nice if they were but it isn't um and so the second step is to look at all the toolkits as a group decide what you're going to do what's a low hanging fruit what's the easiest thing you need to do and i absolutely loved um joe's talk 
because Joe brought it back to the data and the central importance of um, why it's so important that we're building out these common, common data standards and data models and things that we can use because once you have that in place, then there, there is natural opportunity for scaling. Absolutely great. And I think if you're in the audience and you're part of the Safe Care Victoria Collaborative, what Kaz is talking about, a learning health system community is really what's being trying to develop. And I think also sites are finding that there literally is no one way to implement this program and you have to take the bit that's appropriate for you or you might be an assessment only centre to start with, with direct labelling, you may be an oral challenge, you may be a critical care, but that'll depend on your site. It has to be site specific. And we even saw the difference, I think, from personal reflection between an Austin and Peter Mac model, completely different, but with the same outcomes. Uh, Joe? So I love that concept of the learning health community. And I think it's something that's been done very poorly in the past in the antibiotic allergy research and practice space. I think collaboration is really key. And the problem is too big for just allergists to manage and just allergists to tackle. I think you really agree that we need to get all of those stakeholders in and everyone has a role to play in antibiotic allergy assessment and delay, not just the allergist. Yeah. Can I ask why, Wayne, though, you, you guys may do as your careers all these fantastic clinical trials and randomised clinical trials and outcomes, but how do you then take that clinical trial and embed it in practice? I think there's still a difference. There's, there's an outcome in a trial and there's implementing, in, implementing it. Do you have a sense about that question? Do you want me to have a go at that, Jase? It's made for you, Cass. So this is the bringing in the concept of implementation science. So what Jace has been doing over the years is actually been um, an amazing program of health services research, developing up a, this clinical pathway of delabeling um, and then backing it up with some discovery signs, you know, it's really incredible and translational work. The challenge is, is getting those results into clinical practice. And um, there are some simple, simple things to think about when you're getting going and also some more complex things. So implementation science per se really is thinking about um, do we have a framework in place that means that these toolkits are going to be adopted into clinical practice? We've already just heard from Joe and Jace that there's no single thing that will plug in play. And why is that? So if you actually went back and did a what we call a perhaps a qualitative study using, you know, behaviour change wheel or some other framework more formally, you would then unpick and understand within that organisation what is different about that organisation. could be all sorts of things. But those frameworks are important because they understand what are the knowledge gaps, what are, what's the infrastructure that's needed, what are the things that are going to motivate people to change that behaviour in that environment, um, what, are, what are going to be the barriers and what are going to be the facilitators. So the very simplest thing one of the things that I would recommend that you do is, and it's, it's, I don't think it's any different to those of you, many of you will have done the PDSA framework or what matters to you or something like that. It's understanding what are the current processes in your organisation. And that might be processing, process, map, process mapping, what would happen right now if a patient had an allergy label? Well, it might, might be nothing. It might be, oh, we'll have some documentation in the EMR, maybe a referral to immunology. We have no idea what happens to the patient. We have no idea if that information, what happens if they are delabeled, where that goes. We have no idea if it's sent out to the GP. We don't even know what's given to the patient. So you have to go through this very detailed gap analysis and process mapping before you get going. And that will get you a long way to understanding where you're starting with. The second thing is, there is this concept of um, making sure that if you are developing up a process about something, then you need to be very, very clear who are the actors and what are the actions? And if they have actions, what are the actions and what are the timeliness, et cetera, et cetera. What I specifically mean by that, um, and there is a framework for this, it's called the ACT framework. If you have an allergy program, what is the role of the nursing staff? 
what is the role of the junior medical staff? What's the role of the senior medical staff? What's the role of the board of pharmacist, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. If, if you can document clearly in your pathway what, are, what are everyone's roles are, it makes it much easier when you start to develop the intervention. So for nursing staff, for example, when they're taking a patient history and the, and the patient um, describes a you know, type A reaction, et cetera, et cetera, that they can clearly have enough knowledge and education to actually start to document it, then that leads to discussion with the pharmacist, the pharmacist could then do the pen pass and off you go. And then, and then you have a real clinical pathway that will work. Um, and so they're, they're two simple things to think about that bring in you know, implementation science frameworks. And then part of that should happen with every clinical trial. So we call them hybrid implementation studies. So at the same time you're developing up your clinical trial, you're also doing some qualitative um, focus groups, perhaps using one of these theoretical frameworks to understand what you need to do to make sure that it's adopted into clinical practice. And at the other end, thinking about how you're going to measure the cost effectiveness or, or cost benefit or whatever else you're going to do to demonstrate clinical efficacy. And then those of you who are there on Friday, given that much of this is around data and digital solutions, if you do have a digital solution, then we need to be looking at how you would evaluate the digital solution. So that's not just, that's, that's extra on top of what it does around the allergy. So that's actually understanding, does the app work in my organisation? Does it, is it fit for purpose? Is it, do I trust it? You know, is it up to date? Um, where does my data go? Is it secure? All those things, um, digital evaluation is a new area for all of us, but actually really, really important. Thanks, Kaz. Some really good insights there. I think take that whatever setting you are, that those are going to be uh, important. There's a really good question that's been raised by Kate Grogan as well, and we get this a lot. I might ask the group for this. Um, have any suggestions to promote allergy testing at rural and remote hospitals? And I would even say the extension for that is subacute care, you know, outside the big shiny tower. What do you do at, for us, the REPAT, for example, the subacute aged care? So um, does people have thoughts about how you could promote or start some stuff there? Yeah, go, Joe. So I think I think the way I would answer this is you don't even need to promote allergy testing. I think if you're at a site that has never really had any interrogation into antibiotic allergies, I think the first step is actually think about them critically. Look at the allergy on the chart the patient's telling you, think about it critically and start to think about how would I assess this in terms of risk assessment. So if you can start to actually even complete the, the allergy information clearly and fully rather than just penicillin rash, I think goes a long way. If you can improve that, so it goes a long way to then reach those next steps of actually reaching allergy testing, risk stratification and delabeling after that. I will add while people are thinking, I think when you're in those rural remote settings, your actual clinician is irrelevant. I think mean, that's a terrible thing to say, but the workforce you have to engage is pharmacy and nursing. And so putting all your eggs in those baskets for medical reconciliation when people are admitted to get the things Joe's talking about entered really does start half the conversation. And you'll either get direct delabeling removal, you'll start an appetite for, you know, well, why are we giving moxifloxacin instead of keftraxone for that low-risk penicillin allergy. You start having these conversations there and then you can build a delabeling program on that. But I think it all starts with point of care assessment. Alicia, Jason, I might... Oh, sorry, Jason. I might just um, give an example of... We, we've got a site at um, Aubrey Wodonga Health that have um, initially partnered really well with the Austin and have been able to implement their own penicillin allergy ass assessment and oral challenge program um, independently, and it's uh, facilitated by an ID registrar and a very enthusiastic ID AMS pharmacist. And they've done a great job in the past year of assessing patients, delabeling them, assessing the antimicrobials going forward, and have been able to continue that program and, and sustain it. So um, as I understand it, that pharmacist has got really engage good engagement from the pharmacists in the department who also refer directly into the ID AMS service as well. So you, you don't necessarily need a, a particular type of clinician as long as you have people that are sort of keen to collaborate and get something up and going, success can, can definitely occur. The Aubrey model is one of the greatest success. I don't know if anybody from Aubrey's here, but 
Aubrey Wodonga Health, that is a, a fantastic model that other sites should emulate. In fact, we put that forward before our own pro protocol for the Safer Care Victoria rollout because I thought it was fantastic. Um, I'm going to move to Richard's questions and actually Elise and then Kaz might have a bit of a way forward for this. But um, traditionally, it's asking about the consent process and traditionally that's been from a, a medical officer. Um, but how do we maybe go about progressing to RNs and C and Cs and is anybody doing that currently? Kaz, do you want to talk about the uh, experience? Look, I think I think the challenge comes um, really with where this this is scope of practice, and so you can achieve that. So most many hospitals will have a new technology committee or some committee where you have established and get sign off for a clinical pathway and have agreement that um, that nursing or pharmacy can actually do the consent process, and then you know many. Many will already have a, an ethics process in place because they're collecting that data. A good example is a sepsis pathway work where um, in the early days, uh, it, it was somewhat of a change in practice for nurses to be able to initiate the sepsis pathway, put cannulas in, get all the bloods and things like that. Um, and so I think it comes down to um, local agreements regarding scope of practice. And there will usually be a process in place at your organisation. Now that is a little challenging and we find uh, with implementation of things in rural regional, they just don't have that, um, they don't have the um, governance resources to, to sometimes do that, but often they're partnering with a larger organisation. So that, was, that would be the other thing to partner with a principal referral organisation, a hub and spoke and get that partner organisation to assist. And there's a lot of stuff happening now with virtual models of care, virtual models of clinical research and things where we should be able to help our colleagues um, do something when they can't. Yeah, I don't know if that answers it, but- Yeah, I think it goes some way to answering it actually. I think the other component is that each local hospital is gonna to have to develop a, you know, a pathway or a scope of practice. And it seems like for a pharmacist way, that's not insurmountable, that's doable. But it's a shame we're doing it at each individual shot site. Surely this should be a, a national approach or an SHPA led, you know, something where we're credentialing, particularly pharmacists, um, which are taking really accurate medical histories on admission uh, to be able to consent with some medical oversight. I think we've still got a way to go, Richard, but hopefully we'll get there in the next year or so, actually. I mean, there's one thing, consenting it's another thing writing up the order for the oral challenge right so so they can't do it all on their own but i can't understand why we can't have a situation when the pharmacist can consent them for the procedure Bloody great uh we'll move to the next question i think it's for you joe grace curry's mentioned this you mentioned the importance of having high quality data going into our learning health system to make sure of accurate analysis there's a lot of variation in data entry processes between even within clinical teams? How have you approached the standardization of clinical data entry, entry and what challenges did you have with that type of behavior change? Great question. That is a good question. Good luck answering, and... Joe, all the best. <laughs> <laughs> Look, I think it's a, it's a challenge, right? And you've identified, Grace, that it's a challenge. Um, I think the the apps go away to solve a lot of the problems with data entry in that it's not a lot of free text. So you're selecting questions, you're selecting answers, which means it's very standardized in terms of what goes in. Um, so, you know, I, I alluded to it in my talk, anytime where you have double handling of data, you're collecting data here in a database, an Excel spreadsheet, and you've got to transcribe that into Redcap. That would send me, that would send big alarm bells in my mind that you're going to get loss of data and accuracy is going to be affected. So trying to directly input into database with um, uh, specific um, points, uh, as we have done in the apps, I think goes away to solve some of that as well. Um, and we've said, I've, you know, we found that very successful in Prepare. I, I suspect it's going to be success, very successful in NAN as well. Um, but we'll see. Any other thoughts from anyone else? 
I think, I, I'm not sure if this is what you're leading to, but um, the electronic medical record is a source of truth for the patient. No app, nothing that we build for NAN is the actual source of truth. So the real source of truth is the electronic medical record. And that's where I think there's a lot of variation. And um, I think it's something that, that your team could really assist with. And if we could provide some recommended templates for EMRs, um, we do have the clinical care standard for AMS, which is now formally addressing, partially addressing um, documentation for allergies. It's not very granular. And then the other opportunities we have is really um, thinking about how we um, examine quality of documentation within the NAPS, you see, because that could be a nice driver for change as well. And so that's something that we have very keen to look at in the NAPS actually, um, building out the allergy, allergy audit, um, which is a little different to what your app's doing, because it's actually then monitoring, how, having an external look and see to see what kind of quality of information has been entered. But I think it has been a challenge. I mean, any of us have been involved in decision support and even EMR tenders over the years. There, there really isn't an international consensus on how that's supposed to be documented. So we have an ideal opportunity to set up the Australian, um, even if it's only part of the way, Jace, have like have something that this is what we consider to be a minimum standard stand for documentation, provide that as part of the accreditation pack, um, get it out there and and then and then examine it. Um, yeah, yeah, that's really great. I think the standard of care should be name, severity, and a reaction type that is drop downable and not free text. And yeah. we should be working to have those central things, which are if you're an epic or a CERNA built in. So there's no reason why we can't have those as standard templates. But I agree, the app is not the source of truth. The source of truth is trying to get everything into the EMR, but then the EMR talking to other EMRs and community providers. There's no point putting it in the Royal Melbourne Epic EMR that the patient presents at the Austin Hospital with sepsis and, you know, they get a bit taser. In a bad Actually, that's situation. a question for you, Jace. You know, the, the digital, the what's it called? The allergy phenotype of a patient is a single phenotype for their whole life. Well, obviously, it might be changing if they're delayable, of course. How do we get to that? How do we get to the holy grail of a person knowing what their allergy phenotype is and if everyone else who looks after them to know what their allergy phenotype is? Well, it comes back to data, doesn't it? Like, it's got to be data that is transmissible and is moving between, like, because we can teach a million pharmacists and nurses to take an allergy history, which means probably diddly squat if we can't get the actual phenotype transferred, I think, to what we should be calling a digital phenotype. The digital phenotype needs to go with their actual phenotype, but uh, it's too disparate at the moment. We're a long way from that. Yeah, maybe this group uh, will solve it. Um, are there any other questions? I'd love to have a show of hands from all the um everyone online as to how many people are actually doing de-labelling in their hospitals or, or organisations. That would be good. If they're willing to do that. Let's see, can you... Hands up, if you, here we go. Assessment or de-labelling, hands up. Not many. So either shy or not. Three, here we go, some are going. And a names, names I know, great. I know some more names that are doing it, so. Yeah, I think it represents, even if we're getting a few more names here, a big issue, don't we? Because I think we've shown you there are the tools there, the big pieces in the support and governance and the implementation. And uh, that's our next step clearly as a group, isn't it, to get sites comfortable have local governance and implement it. I think they're things that we need. Right. I think it's great to see more and more and more data coming out to show the PEMFAS tool is, is effective and safe. And, yeah. um, and I think what you'll see is that, you know, the early adopters and then driving that diffusion of adoption, you know, peak. Um, yeah. and, 
you know, the early adopters driving the late adopters and hopefully that's all we'll start to see. Fingers crossed. All right. Well, on that note, everybody likes to finish a meeting a little early. So we're going to give you five minutes back. Uh, thank you again to the speakers for uh, their talks today and Anna in her absence. Thank you very much for NCAS for the opportunity for the group to put on the talk, in particular CAS for the support. And thanks everybody for attending. Um, we're a very collaborative group. So if you have a question, please reach out to us. If we don't know the answer, we will know somebody that will. Uh, and if we don't know, if nobody knows the answer, then we should study it. So please um, get in touch with us. Thanks everybody. Have a good afternoon. Thanks team. Thanks, everyone.